so, so the conclusion that I came to is that there was this moment where part of me was terrified. I've heard the word annihilation, you know, where it, it was like so scary, mm -hmm. either that I was gonna die, which was entirely possible. We were out in a field and I was literally hemorrhaging. Yeah. And I cracked this huge bone over here and this blood is piling up. Yeah. Where I was either gonna die or part of me was worried, like, I can't get up. Am I paralyzed? And just like freak out, panic. Like yeah. that is the trauma. Totally out of control. And there's the threat of my life that I might die. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Song. And as I've seen every day, life can change in a moment. On this show, we tell the stories that matter most, after which we are never the same. I am truly honored to introduce our next guest, Dr. Larry Burchett. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> it's good to be here. Oh, thank you. You're, um, you're in my seat, you know. Yeah. And it <clears throat> feels very comfortable. Do you like that over there? Oh, yeah. Uh, this one, it actually, it's, um, you know, it is different seeing the world from this side of the show. Really? Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm a, I'm a little nervous-er. Hmm. Yeah. To open yourself up. Whoa. To, to share. That sounds kind of scary. Uh, yeah, to be vulnerable and tell tell one of my stories, one of my moments. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I wanted to say you did an incredible job on that introduction, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> was that your first try? I was. <laughs> I'm going to murder you so bad. Um, Larry, you and I have known each other a, a pretty good long time. Almost 14 years. Almost 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. That is a long time. And um, we went to residency together. Yeah. Our Almost kids got have kicked played. out together. <laughs> our first call night, we left. Was that our first call night? Yeah. That was our first call night, you and me. And we left the hospital. Still, to, at the time, it still made sense to me <laughs> that it was okay to leave the premises and go watch a high school football game next door. But oh, man. nobody else I saw it that way. Yeah, I should have known better. <clears throat> um, we have known each other a long time. I'm glad you're here. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. I, you know, I really appreciate this opportunity, actually, to kind of take over your show, <laughs> you know, I can't fill your shoes, but I am very interested in the subject matter today because, uh, you know, over the years we, that we've known each other, you have alluded to um, uh, the incident that you're going to share with us mm -hmm. today a couple of times, mm -hmm. but I've never had a chance to sit down, talk to you about it kind of know about it in mm -hmm. detail and and I, I'm very very curious about it uh, and uh, I'm really glad that you're willing to share it yeah the accident it's funny it's a big deal it's a, it's a big moment yeah. it's funny that I just I don't know I assumed that I, I knew you well enough that we'd talked about it at some point but you know you get things happen so long ago you forget about some of them and even though they make a big big impact on your life and even 20 years later I'll get into this a little bit is it is crazy mm. how much this accident this car accident I was in in high school has even to today affected my life mm. so here's the story I was a senior in high school <clears throat> St. Thomas Aquinas Overland Park Kansas, mm -hmm. class of 1997, and a group of buddies were driving senior spring break to go to Colorado to ski. Mm -hmm. Denver was maybe, I don't know, eight hour drive or something like that. And we had gotten up early and had driven out there and I had driven my dad's, was it the, the Buick Regal or the Oldsmobile, some red 
sedan Oldsmobile. And I had done the first leg, and we had driven on I-70 from Kansas City. We were almost at the Colorado border. So I don't know, we'd gone maybe five hours. And I switched, and my buddy drove uh, after that. How many guys are in the car with you? Three. Wow. So there was three or four cars. Uh, there was one in front, us, maybe one or two behind. I don't remember mm. how many. And, um, you know, senior year, I was looking at colleges. And I, so we traded. I was in the back seat. And I asked him to get me this bag I had left in the front seat <clears throat> so I could look at the college book and obsessively read over Notre Dame and whatever other colleges I was applying to yeah. to see what I was, where I was going to go to school. And, and he took his eyes off the road for a minute to grab the bag, and the car had veer, gone to the side of the road a little oh, bit. We were oh. going straight, and we were yeah. kind of on half on gravel and half on the road. Oh. Might have been okay. But he overcorrected and he jerked the wheel. And so the car started fishtailing back and oh, forth. No. And I remember all of this. You know, like when that happened, it was it was totally one of those like slow motion things like you see in the movies. Like totally was like that bizarrely. Because wow. like it's like I was frozen and I knew I was like, oh, shit. You know, like something's going to happen, yeah. you know. So the, it fishtails a few times, and then we're skidding perpendicular on the road. Oh, my goodness. Like this. Like, we were going fat. Like, I mean, you're driving out there probably going 70 or yeah. 80. So it's going like this. And the car probably eventually would have come to a stop. Yeah. But there was a half pipe that water would drain down. Oh. Because the car was partially off the road, the wheel hit that half uh -huh. pipe, and the car flipped. Oh, my goodness. So I remember being frozen in the car and seeing all of this happening. And God, I'm even getting the little chibis imagining it again. But so I'm like frozen in the back seat. I was going to take a nap. I didn't have my seatbelt on. Yeah. Car's skidding back and forth. And the next thing I know is I see out the windows sky, grass sky and then it's black and then the next thing i know i wake up in this field and i like look around and i'm like i'm not even thinking what happened all i'm thinking is get up and i can't get up mm. like trying to do a push-up and i'm like stuck oh you're on your face i'm your like front. face down yeah. in the grass and i'm like i have no idea I'm not i'm i'm in some kind of shock i'm not really feeling a lot you know like i'm just out of it yeah and what had happened was the <clears throat> my dad kind of had later figured this out but what had happened was the car had and i pieced the story from my friends that were there too but the car had flipped and the first time it rolled it had smashed the back window out and then the second time i was ejected out the back oh, okay. and then the car rolled on top of me oh, and you could see on my brown corduroys. Uh -huh. I wore brown corduroys in high school. You could you could see on my brown corduroys this red streak of car paint that uh, was kind of around the thighs and the hips. But yeah. what had happened was the car had crushed my pelvis. So I had a pelvic fracture in three different places. Wow. I think two on the side here and then this guy on the left, the iliac crest was broken like that big bone was yeah. crushed so I'm in this field and I don't know what's going on one of my friends comes over and he's like he just like I could I remember this but I could like see that you know they were freaking out and he's like don't move yeah you know don't just don't just don't move I don't know I just my memory is like I'm just like cold uh -huh. in this field uh -huh. for an hour uh -huh. there were various you know people I don't know if I believe in angels but that's what there were people that helped mm -hmm. called the ambulance called so I got life flighted in a helicopter mm. we were on almost on the in Colorado so I was life flighted to Denver mm. 
and I remember, I remember that super loud. I was really cold. Mm. I was just, I mean, in the moment, looking back on it now, it was totally dissociated and disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I remember feeling a general pain, but it didn't hurt that bad. I was yeah. just like so out of it. Just like I'm like there, mm -hmm. you know, freezing in this thing, and I, I don't remember getting scanned. I'm sure I got there and they pumped me with morphine, and mm -hmm. I was. I remember a little bit. I remember kind of laying in this room all alone, and mm -hmm. um, I remember I had on the way out there. I had drunk a bunch of Gatorade. Nobody was drinking in the car or anything like that. I had drank a bunch of Gatorade, and so my bladder was really full and so I get to the ER and I'm sitting there and I like screaming to the nurses I gotta pee and they tried to put a catheter in mm. and I was like this is really weird I have to pee I would try to relax and I like couldn't pee mm. and then, you know something was wrong and I just I was like in agony it was like the worst like you gotta pee thing yeah. and they couldn't get a catheter in they kept trying which was not fun <laughs> yeah. for all those in the crowd who have had catheters in there it's horrible. It's like one of the yeah. worst feelings ever. Yeah. But um, what had happened was when my pelvis was crushed, you know, the the bladder sits there and the tube, the, the urethra that goes out, it was severed. Oh, it was. Yeah. So I couldn't pee because that tube was disconnected. And thank God my bladder didn't just empty my ur urine into my abdomen. They were so, trying to put a catheter in. So they were trying to they put didn't a catheter. Know it was well, they didn't know. Severed. No, they didn't. I guess I don't. I don't know the details of that. Maybe that was before I got a scan, oh, or boy. I don't know what happened. So, yikes! So they put a super pubic in. Oh my goodness! I yeah. still got the scar right yeah. here. So they kind of slashed me. And I remember when they made that cut there. Urine like was like a fountain. It was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, and I was like, oh. <laughs> it felt so good, and I'm like out of it. I'm like not real. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't know what. Yeah happened you know so the days after that were blurry because i was so drugged up but that i you know that night i went to emergency surgery and they put in an external fixator so i had okay. two i still got the scars right mm -hmm. here two screws into you know the iliac crest the mm -hmm. hip the front part of it and this big cage that connected out of it to stabilize mm -hmm. the pelvis. Mm -hmm. You know, put a whole body cast on, you know. Yeah. They, they were, it was an unstable pelvic fracture. I don't know what they, they didn't open me up. They just mm -hmm. did this fixator and mm. kind of put it all back together. So, you know, I kind of wake up sort of in the ICU, you know, and I'm just like, I wasn't with it, with it. I was, mm. I didn't grasp what had happened kind of woke up and like oh everything's okay and then after a little bit like looked down and i got this cage on me and i'm like kind of freaked out and panicked like oh my god what is this yeah. you know yeah. like what is this thing yeah. just the experience of waking up out of that and being in this just morphine delirium in yeah, the, in the hospital yeah alone this, too probably were you alone um you know, my, so what I've been, to, so my mom got on a plane and flew right away. Mm -hmm. And I think she would have been there when mm -hmm. I woke up after mm -hmm. surgery, I think. Mm -hmm. My dad and sister drove out, mm -hmm. you know, later that day. And, uh, yeah, I get a little emotional when I think about them. Mm -hmm. it was, I was, <clears throat> it was really hard on my mom because she got on a plane and didn't know if I was okay. Yeah. And my dad and sister drove out there. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, it was, it was bad. And, I mean, there's the obvious, I could have died, mm -hmm. you know. But my dad said initially they were saying things like, might be paralyzed, might never be able to walk again. He yeah. told me that there were spine fractures. Mm. I've never gone back and looked at mm -hmm. all of the stuff, but yeah. um, but I think for you know for them a lot of the unknown of am I going to be okay, and then what's the outcome going to be? Am I going to be able to walk again? Am I going to mm -hmm. be 
in a wheelchair or paralyzed with this urethra trauma they had said that I may not ever be able to have kids. Mm. Ellie's nine. <laughs> um, so much for that theory. Um, but I, you know, I'm out of it that whole time, and I have heard about how hard that was on them. So I wake up. Mm-hmm. I think my mom's there. It's all so cloudy. I, you know, the guys that were... At, you know, like, so they watch me in this accident. I've heard them kind of tell the story. Some of them saw the car. Some of them were like driving by. The car's rolling. I mean, yeah. it's, the two other guys in the car, Garrett and Joel, were fine. They weren't hurt. So they were you okay. You were the only one in that car that was hurt? I was the only one that was hurt. Wow. They had their seatbelts on. Yeah. Who knows? I, you know, would I have had. My head would have been hurt if I had the seatbelt on. Who knows? I mean, I would have been ejected. And, um, they were fine. I remember the guys coming to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the story goes, I was like, you guys got to go on the trip. You can't mm. cancel. The, like, have, fun, have a good time. For me, as mm-hmm. much as you can. Who wants yeah. to be the guy to cancel the trip because you're hurt? Because your pelvis is broken. Because my pelvis yeah. is broken and I can't pee. <laughs> no reason to cancel the trip. No reason that. to cancel the whole trip. Yeah. So, um, so I remember the, <clears throat> God, it's such a haze, but, but I remember, you know, so I've got this thing in me and I'm in the ICU. I, you know, I had, I lost. A significant amount of blood. I had this crazy hematoma because when I had this fracture over here, mm-hmm. it was like it was like I had a melon on yeah. my hip, like this enormous hematoma. This is still kind of numb on uh-huh. this side because uh-huh. whatever cutaneous nerves were severed. Um, I had this huge thing over there, but but I remember after so many days, like they get you up really fast mm-hmm. for physical therapy. That was the worst pain I have ever felt mm-hmm. in my life. Was they would come in. And they'd get these big guys to lift me out of the bed and mm-hmm. put me in this chair and then wheel me down to the PT thing. And mm-hmm. they would hit me with the pain medicine beforehand. Mm-hmm. But this was so tight and painful and uncomfortable in my low back, I guess that fracture and everything. Like, you know, the more you get up and the more mobile and the more mm-hmm. you move and everything, the quicker you're going to recover. Mm-hmm. There was no pain medicine that would help that. It was so bad. Mm-hmm. I remember, you know, I, I do feel lucky about how supported I was. My mom was there. My dad and sister came out. My mom's best friend was there. My best friend uh, at the time, Ben Lewis, mm-hmm. in high school was in Mexico doing a thing. And he flew to Denver for a few days and oh, was wow. there while I was still in the hospital there. And so it was, it was really huge and helpful mm-hmm. to have their support through mm-hmm. all of that. I remember going down to this therapy wing in Denver and I, don't know, I always remember my dad kind of being there coaching me along. But there was this other girl maybe about my age and she had had a similar fracture and but she wouldn't do anything. She wouldn't get up. She wouldn't mm. she just was stuck. Mm. And I remember seeing her and being like I, if I don't, if I don't get up and get through this pain and like take one step at a time, like I'm not going to recover. It was crazy. Like being in an ICU bed for a week or whatever it was, I don't know how long it was. Like I couldn't even, so eventually I get home to Kansas city and I'm in like a rehab hospital for a week Mm -hmm. and then I go home. And when I got home, so this has been three weeks there. Thank God I wasn't paralyzed. Like yeah. I could use my legs, but they were incredibly weak. I remember this physical therapist would come to the house. We'd do these things, do these exercises. I couldn't move my leg on the bed. I couldn't slide it mm. from side to side. Not only like I couldn't lift it yeah. up. It was so weak. I couldn't even slide it from side to side. Oh, wow. So, you know, and I was a football and I wrestled, played baseball. I mean, I was athletic. And 
high school <laughs> as much as I can for my Rudy frame, but um, how quickly I, I lost all this muscle mass and strength and ability and everything. It was just like ground zero, mm -hmm. you know, like rehabbing to walk again, you know, just like doing these little things, getting up in a walker. I mean, I was in a wheelchair for, I don't remember, months or weeks. Eventually I go back to school. I mean, everybody was great there, mm -hmm. you know, buddies helping me out, girls carrying books mm -hmm. and still had to, you know, get through classes. I was playing baseball. That season was obviously over. Yeah went to prom in a wheelchair. Oh. My girlfriend, Megan, at the time, she was so great, mm -hmm. you know, during that time. Um, you know, this big trauma. And so in time, <clears throat> I started getting better. You know, I recovered. And, and the whole time, I never had any doubt. I didn't. I know my mom and dad initially were worried about all these things but mm -hmm. when i came out of this i was just like like the story was i'm going to be okay you know like yeah. i am going to recover like in yeah. time i'm going to walk again and you know I'll, I'll have a full recovery the prognosis was actually good yeah. despite all the trauma and after i don't remember a couple months you know they took the cage the external mm -hmm. fixator they took the cage out I started, you know, I, I would walk, I remember walking in a walker for mm -hmm. however long I couldn't bear weight. It was mm -hmm. partial weight bearing and then I could bear a little more weight and then I would walk around and the bones actually healed up fine. The hard part of the recovery was, and there's some funny stories in here with this, but the hard part of the recovery was this urethra. Yeah. So it, when I was in surgery, they passed a catheter. There was, I had, this is just, we're just going to go there. I had, for all the guys in the crowd, um, I had two catheters. I had one that was directly into my bladder from here. Yeah. It's called a super pubic catheter. You may have placed them, Jack, in your surgical residency. Yeah. So I had that one that they put emergently in the ER so that I could drain my bladder. And then in surgery, they had threaded a Foley catheter through my penis mm -hmm. into my bladder. Mm -hmm. That was awful. That pain was almost as almost worse than the bone pain from the fracture. Oh. As a young man, yeah. you get erections and have wet dreams and all kinds of things, and to have a tube in your penis when it constricts and yeah. gets an erection is one of the most painful things <laughs> oh, I have oh, ever experienced. And How there long was is, it in there? A couple months? It was in there three or four months. Oh, and so goodness. the heart... so. It just, I'll never forget the first time it came out, it felt like somebody was dragging a razor blade through the wow. inside of my penis. It was wow. awful. That thing had been in there, that damn catheter, for weeks or months, and it was all grobbly and just like <laughs> tearing a diamond through there. It was, uh, it was awful. But then the hardest thing about that part of the recovery was we took it out. I peed in the urologist's office, and it was like, hey, we're good. This yeah. is amazing. I'm going to tell this story. This is, this is, I just don't know if I should tell this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So you were uh, talking about how you took the catheter out, you peed in the urologist's office, and you were like, oh, I'm fine. At that point, the fixator was off, and I was like, oh my God, I'm recovered. Yeah. You know, like, this is the next big step of being free and recovered from this yeah. trauma. And so... Oh, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this story. You have to tell it. I know. <clears throat> I had a date with my girlfriend that night, and oh. I was really squirrely about kissing her and stuff because I didn't want to get an erection with the catheter yeah. on. Like, yeah. it was, that was just so, she was great, but I was not comfortable uh, with any of that. Like, yeah. I'm going to make out with somebody with a tube in your penis. Yeah. Like, Oh, oh, God, I think back to that poor kid. Um, so I had never kissed her, so I was like, I'm going to kiss her tonight. I got my little banaka, and I was all, like, ready to go. And this, I was a 
that was pretty late bloomer. I'd never kissed anybody. Mm. It's like 18, oh, that was, 17 that was, or 18. She was yeah. my first kiss after senior year of high school. So this is so embarrassing. So my mom picks us up, right? Picks her up. We go to the movies. Sit down. I don't remember what the movie was. Get started. I'm like, well, I got to go to the bathroom. I go to the bathroom, and I'm at the urinal, and nothing's coming out. It's like oh. a drop or two's coming out. Oh. It's like, oh, shit. I go back, sit down. I'm like, yeah. well, maybe it's just a little bladder spasm or something yeah. from the tube just coming out or whatever. Yeah. It's like, no, I got to go to the bathroom. Go back. Not even, I can't even squeeze a drop. Oh, no. This is the same day they had taken the yeah, thing out. Yeah. I'd peed and you in, already peed. I'd peed into this flow, your whatever that measured the flow. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. It was like wide open. And I was like, I mean, how awful is this for this kid? But I was like, Megan, I can't pee. I think I gotta call my mom. Oh my gosh. So, so much for the kiss. Awful. My mom comes and picks me up. I don't know what we did with her. I go to the emergency room. Now, being an ER doctor, I've seen catheters put in a million times. Yeah. They did not know what they're doing. Just like so many times, we don't know what we're doing. Yeah. We fake it. But they rammed that thing oh, in there. Wow. And like, you have to relax in order for the sphincter to open and dilate a little bit. How can you relax? <laughs> Oh, that was the worst. Eventually, they got that catheter in. He had to laser me, this urologist, like two or three more times before oh, that thing stayed open tissue? because of scarring. Yeah. And I've talked to urologists now, yeah. and they're like, oh, yeah, that would never work. And we did it. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, I had no <laughs> idea how. So the hardest part of that stage in the recovery it wasn't like, am I going to walk again? You know, I had gotten over that first yeah. hump. And now it was like, am I going to wear a bag forever? Mm. You know, like, am I ever going to be free of this thing? Like, am I going to have, am I gonna have kids? And mm. that part of the recovery was really questionable. Then there was this really screwy thing. And this one's just so disturbing. But so they do cystoscopy. The urologist goes in with a camera and he sees the scarring and he he lasers it. That's mm. the procedure. And it's conscious sedation. So I'm mm. not, it's not, it's not general, general anesthesia where mm -hmm. you're totally asleep. You're like in la la land. So they give me these meds. You do the thing. And I, you, your experience as a person is you go to sleep, you wake up. You don't, you're out, right? Yeah. And, and in the recovery room, he's like, it, he's like, is everything okay? And I was like, what do you mean is everything okay? I'm fine. He's like, well, this is really disturbing to me. He's like, well, you were screaming during the procedure. And I was like, what? What? I think they gave me ketamine or some dissociative oh, so yeah. that I wouldn't have any memory of uh, the thing. But yeah. like, it was just subtly disturbing to right. go through something and apparently have been in all this pain and then like yeah. wake up like nothing was happening, yeah. you know? Like, so finally I get this last thing and it's open and we take it out and I pee and everything's okay. And thank God, since then, I've never had a problem with that thing closing. Wow. wow. I would have some like leakage for a while every yeah. now and again. Um, my daughter's nine, I can reproduce. Yeah. <laughs> but I wasn't <laughs> sure about that for a while. Uh -huh. But, and then, and then I went to college, I went to Notre Dame and Second, sophomore year of college, you know, after a year of continued getting back in shape or whatever, I played full contact football. Mm. So I fully recovered. So, so, and this is the thing that I want to get in to talk about for the, for, with the show, Life Can Change in a Moment, because I seemingly, the story that I told myself then was, oh, wow, I fully recovered. Everything's okay. And this just, people always ask me, well, is that when you wanted to be a doctor? No, I wanted to be a doctor beforehand. Mm -hmm. But this, did this affect me and what I did in medicine? I would have said, oh, it, it's, you were a patient. Mm -hmm. You are a patient. It's good. What are you guys doing over there? Sorry, the light died. I'm trying to fix it. Do you want me to stop? Uh, just give me one second. <laughs> What was I talking about? Being a patient. 
um, <clears throat> you were, you kind of told yourself uh, that you were okay. You were okay. The question okay. about whether right, 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 right. it affected your choice to be a doctor. Yeah, you were bringing it all together with how you produced the show I talked about. Before. You good? With your moment. We good? Um, so the story at that point was physically I had, I was lucky and I had, almost, I mean, really completely recovered. Mm -hmm. My bones had healed, played full contact football. I'd squatted a couple 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, I had some occasional pains. Like I couldn't, mm, running was different, still a little crooked, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, um... But really, physically, I had recovered. And people, but, and so, so the physical part totally recovered. I had, I was, I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. And there was a period in high school where I started to get into it more. And when this thing happened, this was like the existential, similar to what you had, mm -hmm. you know, with your, with your own illness, but it's like, what am I doing on this planet? Yeah, you know this this intensity of I really did almost die. Mm -hmm. um, was I? Am I here for a reason? Mm. Is, is, was I? Was I? Or was I saved for something? And and just really questioning, what am I doing here, and what is this all about? Yeah. So in college, my second major was philosophy. My minor was pre med major philosophy and theology and I just would read all of these books on religion and spirituality and philosophy mm. and all that stuff but it was really getting at these these core questions of existence mm -hmm. because I felt like I came so close to I didn't see the light or yeah. anything like that yeah. I don't remember a tunnel and all, but yeah. I, I remember just waking up in the field and then having a lot of time to think yeah. and just being like, what am I doing here? Yeah. You know, what, what's, what is the meaning of life? Well, it, right. You, I mean, you're kind of getting at the core question, which is, well, was it just sort of random chance that the car ran over my pelvis instead of my head? Or it, is there a it, reason or meaning? For right. It, it, I don't... I don't know if I, I don't know if I believe stuff like that or not. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. But I think somewhere my psyche was like you're here for a reason and you got to mm -hmm. figure it out. And you got to you got to do something big. Mm -hmm. You know, and meaningful and mm. and make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know? And so I think somewhere in that moment, these this time afterwards where I was recovering was born, was really planted this seed of wanting to make my life meaningful in mm -hmm. a big way because mm -hmm. I'm here and I got a shot. I got a second shot yeah. and I'm able to walk and yeah. I'm able to do things that after what I went through, I don't know that most would have been as lucky yeah you know so i got so i got super into that stuff so so it's it's no surprise that i love this show where mm -hmm. i'm asking other people questions about their moments and how they've played out through their own lives how certain things that have happened long ago are still affecting and influencing mm -hmm. what they believe and how, how they live, what's important to them, all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So people say, you know, did you, is that what made you want to be a doctor? No, I always wanted to be a doctor, but then that happened and it was like, yeah, I, I want to be a doctor even more, mm -hmm. you know, and I care about all the little things that patients experience from an extra blood draw and an yeah. IV to a catheter. I think yeah. it's very easy as a doctor to be like, put the catheter in, just go get it. And now I'm like, uh, do we have another option when yeah. it comes to this catheter? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I had a guy, this was a couple weeks ago. He's like, I ain't getting no catheters, old man. And I'm like, listen, I've had a catheter before. Okay. They're horrible. 
All right, I'm just going to be honest with you. If there was another way I could do this, I would do it. You're going to be okay. This is temporary, and you're not even going to have it as long as I had it. So we're putting in the catheter. He's like, all right, I'll do it because you had one, you know? So it, it really, like, but people like, you know, like when you've gone through stuff and you can relate to patients like that. Uh-huh. Let me tell you this story because this was the worst, and this is how I feel about pain med. You know, like, you get the pain med, and I was doped up a lot when I was in the hospital. And to be honest, like, it took the edge off, but it didn't really mm-hmm. help that much. Mm-hmm. And I had gotten to a point where I remember this was in the rehab hospital. So this was a couple weeks after the thing. And I had so many pain meds that I was constipated. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was awful. I got all these enemas, all this stuff, mm. nothing worked. And mm. finally, I just got on the pot and I gave birth to, I mean, we're talking. You pushed it out. It was, it was bigger than, I, it was the <laughs> biggest turd wow. I had ever. And I'm like, and I'm like, Aah! like I'm like yelling down the hall. Yeah. And yeah. like that thing came out and I said, that was the moment where I was like, I am never taking any pain pill again. I'll take Tylenol and ibuprofen maybe, but I don't want any more oxy whatever. That was so awful. I will deal with the pain. That was it. No more pain meds. That was the end of that. Yeah. That constipation was so bad. So bad. So I had my own like experience where all of these things that matter to patients that don't really matter to doctors because we care if they get better or they die like so folks on the bottom line forget about you know do these things actually matter to people yeah Yeah, they do oh that was so bad uh we're 40 minutes into it do we need to you're getting close you're getting close we're at 622 so okay okay so uh, i i want to because uh, I want to ask this question because uh, it feels like <clears throat> kind of what you're saying is I had this horrible accident. There were so many questions about whether I would live, whether I would, it, even if I live, what, it, am I going to be disabled? If I'm not going to be disabled, am I going to have be able to bear kids? Uh, all of this stuff, traumatic things, and then you kind of come out of it on the other end seemingly completely recovered right and with this sort of almost a purpose-driven new uh, sense of um, life and everyone would say from an external point of view oh wow I mean you know no one would wish that on anyone but you made the best of it it kind of became the best of what it could be yeah now you're you're maybe even um, better for it. Right. But I feel like there's this hint of, yeah. but that's not exactly the whole story. There's something underlying that kind of still sort of is a residual thing that has affected you since then. Yeah. I'm correct about that? That's right. We're getting there. Oh. Yeah. So I come out of this thing and it's like, I want to do something big. I do all these service things. I do international stuff at Notre Dame and in med school. And I'm like, I want to do Doctors Without Borders after. Go to residency in Martinez. You and I were there for a couple years. I'm going to do that. This is going to be my way to save the world. The grand mission, really, that I wanted to live that was born in this moment, in in that accident of wanting to really give my life to a cause and to something great and to serve the world. And that was the best way. That's why I did family medicine. Just like you described in your interview, <clears throat> being able to take care of everybody, the mom, the baby, a grandpa in a hut in Africa yeah. and, you know, make the biggest difference to the world. Like that was what I was going to do. You know, a couple things changed that. I bought a house in Berkeley. I was like, I'm going to buy this house and sell it in three years and pay off my med school debt. And of course I bought it in 2006 and then it went like this and I owed $100,000 on it in 2009 and I couldn't sell it. I didn't have that money. And then I made a baby. And so this big life trajectory, it was like, you know, we decided we were gonna be 
my daughter's mother and decided we were going to go pick co-parents. And I'm like, well, I, I don't want to be a dad in Africa. And yeah. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be a dad. So things change. You come around and help me make that bad idea video to go <laughs> on The Bachelorette. I do that. That was a disaster. But then I realized, I was like, oh, these people want me on television. Maybe I can live this mission of making a po you know, real positive difference in people's lives. And do it in a meaningful way on TV. And so that thing is still playing out. That's yeah. all part of the same yeah. whatever. But <clears throat> where things get really interesting to me that I'm just now getting into, and this is about the psychological and the PTSD stuff of trauma, mm -hmm. is, and this is the best way to describe this, and this is, this is totally crazy to me. I wouldn't believe this. I would never, I was never aware of this. Mm. So a year ago, I can't believe I'm gonna tell this part of the story. A year ago, I had been seeing a therapist since residency. Initially, I go to her and I'm like, I'm like, my job's hard. I'm this incredible doctor and I'm just so strong that I can put up with all of this stuff and my job's hard and I want to talk about my own burnout and wellness. And she's like, that's really good. How are your relationships? And I'm like, not important. <laughs> Let's talk about me and again, how strong and resilient I am and how hard my job is, you know? And she just like digs in relationships over and over and over. And so finally, a year ago, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm 40. I'm ready. I'm not going to live forever. I feel like time is, is more of a commodity now than it ever was. Mm -hmm. I want to, I'm, I'm ready. Like I'm ready to find somebody. I, mm -hmm. I want to have a real love. I want mm -hmm. that to be part of my life. You know, to love somebody in a, in a, I don't know, in a very real, fulfilling way. Mm -hmm. I'm ready for that. And I showed up and I was like, and I know what that means is that I got a lot of work to do, so let's get into that. And I, what I was surprised was, she went right for the trauma. Mm. She, went, she went right to two things. My mother's death, my mom died after college, so this would have been four years after this accident or so. Yeah. And this accident. And I was like, what does that have to do with my love life? Mm. I'm just too picky and all these, mm. whatever, these character flaws that I thought was the problem. And so we start doing this thing called EMDR. And this is when stuff gets crazy. Have you heard of EMDR? No. Eye movement desensitization, I don't know, response or something mm -hmm. like that. It's so freaky. You, you get a buzzer in each hand, okay? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it, they buzz back and forth and you close your eyes. And when you close your eyes, they involuntarily go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So it's like buzz, 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 buzz. Mm. And it distracts your conscious brain enough for you to get into the subconscious and to deal with trauma mm. and to, with the memory and the experience and the beliefs and everything that like was planted mm -hmm. 20 years ago or whatever. So we start getting into this accident. And it was really fascinating what I started finding. So, so I'd kind of close my eyes, I'd get into it, I would recount the story just like I told you. And then I would, there's two different, in this thing you can see it in two different ways. In your own body, mm -hmm. I'm in my body, and then dissociated where you're yeah. looking down at your yeah. body. And I still to this day have the memory where I'm in the car and I'm in my own body. But then when I see myself outside of the thing, I'm dissociated. Huh. I'm looking down at my body and the scene as if I'm hovering. Yeah. So at some point between the accident and me waking up, I disconnected from that. There was that trauma, mm. survival mechanism that happened. And so one of the things we try to go in is to reassociate into that moment. And it's really funny because it's blocked. Mm. And what that means to me is that there was something that happened to me psychologically there that was so scary that part of me is like, we're not even going to go there. And then this is what I think it is. So I've got really curious about this. And I start asking my buddies who were at the scene. And I said, what happened with this thing? And they told me what they knew. And, and I remember Phil Thies he said, well, I remember I came over to you and the first thing you did 
was to ask me to pinch your feet to mm. see if you were paralyzed. Mm. And I was like, I have no memory of that yeah. whatsoever. Like I blocked it. Yeah. Like I blocked it out. Like that was part of it. So, so the conclusion that I came to is that there was this moment where part of me was terrified I've heard the word annihilation, you know, where it, it was like so scary mm -hmm. either that I was going to die, which was entirely possible. We were out in a field and I was literally hemorrhaging. Yeah. And I cracked this huge bone over here and this blood is piling up. Yeah. Where I was either going to die or part of me was worried, like, I can't get up. Am I paralyzed? And just like freak out, panic. Like yeah. that is the trauma totally out of control and there's the threat of my life that I might die yeah. and so 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 we're going into this stuff and that's mm. what like EMDR like gets into that thing mm. and we're like and and I can feel that there's something there and it's like mm. cracking into it so we start doing this therapy on it and, and remember like I came to this thing because I wanted to find a girlfriend <laughs> oh yeah. You know, like that yeah. was the overarching thing. It's so right. that's what led me to get Remember I was recovered. Oh, I'm fine. Right. There's no yeah. my bones healed and my urethra all that stuff, all the plumbing works. And and you felt and when you were looking at your life, you're like, "Oh, everything is great except that I I don't have a deep meaningful relationship. That's the problem." And instead, it's kind of maybe a symptom of yeah, like, I'm just like, okay, like, all right, I'm ready to make this a priority, not work. It's always been about me and this mission, and everything's been second, and now, okay, now I'm getting older. I'm not going to live forever. This is important to me. I want to pursue that. So, so we do this, uh, this EMDR stuff, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know that it worked, nothing really. I got into this thing, and I mm. just was blocked and mm. whatever. Mm. And a week or two later, I met somebody. And I fell in love like I had never mm. fallen, ever, mm. in my whole life. It was crazy. I think I probably told you about it. Yeah. And I was like... You know, I just thought, oh, it was timing and thing, you know, wow, she was great. And that relationship ended. And I would continue to see the therapist. And my therapist was convinced 100% that the reason mm -hmm. that I was able to do that was because I had gone into mm. the trauma. Mm. Because I had gone into this accident, this thing that had happened. Yeah. 20 years ago that I had no conscious even suspicion yeah. that this was still playing out and affecting you so much longer so, so I was like no are you serious and then like so so then I got really interested in trauma and how it affects you I don't have PTSD I don't get into cars I mean initially afterwards I remember I'd get nervous in the back seat and I'd have my seatbelt on if yeah. the car was skidding, stuff like that. But I don't, I don't have that kind of a syndrome, sure. you know. But here it is, like decades later. Oh, why haven't you gotten married? Oh, I'm just picky. Yeah. Like, eh, maybe there's something else going on. Like, maybe it's, maybe it's deeper. Maybe something a lot deeper is affecting that is affecting, you know, being a workaholic and being so right. driven and all right. of these things that, and so, so then I got to thinking about it, I get to know trauma and how it works and I'm observing some of these guests that come in mm -hmm. and when they have traumatic events, they, one guy is into men's health, especially preventing heart disease. We go around this whole thing and finally he tells me that his dad had a heart attack when he was young mm. and how that makes it so much, so personally meaningful to him. And yeah. I was like, God, it makes total sense. One woman who's a matchmaker and her 
own father was her first match and how much joy that gave her at a time when um, her mother was gone and out of the picture. All of these like stories of these impactful huge moments that were often mm -hmm. traumas. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's almost, is it like a coincidence that I work in the ER, mm -hmm. you know, after this thing, oh, well this happened because of, I got the story around it. Oh, I went to Africa and I wanted, I wasn't good at diagnosing things without technology. So I went to ER because I thought that would make me a better doctor. That's true. Yeah. But that may not be the whole, whole story, story yeah. you know. I've read how people, one of the ways people cope with trauma is, you know, you numb and you disconnect from the moment. And there's people that are into adrenaline and all this kind of stuff. I don't do extreme sports. I don't do drugs and, you know, I don't, I'm not an alcoholic or anything like that. But I sure like the ER. Mm -hmm. like I feel alive in the ER. You know, mm -hmm. that, that part of me that was n numbed shut off. I mean, like, I think as men, we're trained and we learn how to numb feelings instead of feel them and work through them and express them in a healthy way. And so then I have this accident thing where survival, I numbed and disconnected to survive. Mm -hmm. And now it, I've found myself in, I mean, what's more in medicine, what's more yeah. stimulating than the ER and somebody yeah. dying right in front of you? What's how can I, in that, that moment, I was so out of control and what's the way now that I could feel the most in control of that being an ER doctor mm -hmm. where I'm totally in the opposite position, Yeah, you know? That's crazy. It's crazy. Life can change in a moment. Yeah. Mine did. Um... Did you end up doing any more of that? And it keeps going. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy how it keeps going. I think the core issue for me mm -hmm. around relationships, it's complicated. My mom died. That's in there too. Mm -hmm. That's another episode. Mm -hmm. But I think there is, um, you know, the fear of being vulnerable of, so when this relationship ended, um, man, it hurt. It tore open some really deep wounds. And the thing that was the most, that was the hardest about it was this feeling that I wasn't in control. Yeah. That there was nothing I could do about something I wanted really bad, somebody that I really cared about. And, you know, the physical symptoms of that was mm. anxiety and I couldn't sleep and I couldn't eat. I felt sick to my stomach and it was just this craziness. Mm. And I think there is a, I think there's a direct connection between the experience of that trauma that I buried Mm -hmm. that I think one of the core parts of trauma is that you're not in control, whether it's rape mm -hmm. or a car accident or mm -hmm. whatever. They're, they're different. There's nuances for sure. But that the core part of it is that you're not in control. Your life is threatened. You experience that. And that's true. That's terror. Mm -hmm. That's true terror. And I, you know, this relationship ends and it's like that wound was ripped wide open and mm -hmm. it became very clear. It's like, whoa, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that thing, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of healing. There's a lot of getting into that. And really what the essence of it is is feeling that stuff that I never felt mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Because mm -hmm. in order to be comfortable being close to somebody, which I think includes the possibility that you're going to lose them, mm -hmm. either they leave or you die, mm -hmm. there will be some goodbye at some point which you're not in control of. It's this, it's this, I don't know, it's, for me, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So until I fix this, till yeah. I feel that, go in there, do on that, this other thing is going to be, this is great for all of my ex-girlfriends to hear, it wasn't you, because <laughs> it really wasn't. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, it was this, it was me. It was this thing that I had. It's complicated. It isn't that simple, but that's, I think that's a big driving thing. And, and it's not all about, that's one aspect, the, the relationship of it, but, but I think you get the theme mm -hmm. that I wanted to highlight with this sto story, which was there are certain moments really in our lives that are so much more impactful and influential yeah. and deterministic mm -hmm. in the rest of our lives. Yeah. And we have to be conscious of, is this how we want the story to go? Mm -hmm. This moment happened, we ended up, I ended up doing ER and da 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 da, like, and, and not getting married and not expert, like, is that the story? Mm -hmm. Sometimes out of it comes good things, but there also has to be a conscious integration of it back into, is this who I want to be, how I want to live, and if not, how do I do the work to mm -hmm. get in there and really heal that thing? Yeah. Right. Seeing these own observations in me makes me really curious about people and how how they end up where they are, mm -hmm. how you ended up, how anybody ends up doing what they do and how these moments really shape us yeah. for better or worse. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it, you know, um, what strikes me about your story is really kind of uh, uh, that picture that you paint where you wake up in the field and you go to move your legs and you can't move it. And even though you don't have a distinct memory of kind of, you know, asking them to pinch your feet or whatever, uh, I can imagine maybe even beyond death because you, you, you know, death is sometimes sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of not a tangible thing, but picturing yourself being paralyzed for the rest of your life and being vulnerable and having to depend on other people um, is even more concrete and um, potentially that could be even more scary and certainly totally understandable that you would have a reaction uh, to that fear that you felt. I, I was in around that whole time I was in such denial of that feeling or fear or whatever. I consciously knew, oh, I could have died, but I didn't feel the, the trauma and the terror of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel it. Incre I mean, it's incredible denial. Mm. You're so serious as a host. It was such a, it was such a heavy topic. Such a downer. It's. Uh, I don't know, think we'll have this guy back. I mean, where do you go from pelvic fracture and urethra laceration? Uh, <laughs> it's hard to go up from, or is it hard to go down? I don't uh, know. Are you making fun of my penis? I don't know. Are you challenging my know. manhood with that, with your but, thumb? Uh, Friendship's over. Yeah, Jerry. but uh, thanks for sharing, though. These are not easy things to share, but uh, thanks for being really vulnerable. It's a crazy story. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm going to well, close the show. We, yeah, so <laughs> we have a little tradition on the show. You might not know this, <laughs> but the guest <laughs> always closes the show. So, I'm so uh, unprepared. So it's just not anything I've ever done before. Please. Being in this chair. Um, thank you to all the guests in season one who have shared their moments. I think I'm doing this for you. I feel a little bit vulnerable, open, and I'm already regretting what I've shared. But I do hope that um, it's insightful and helps others. And thank you for... Thank you for listening. Thank you very much again, Larry. I just want to remind everyone 
uh, who's watching uh, that, uh, no. That's the intro paperwork. Yeah. OK. Be quiet, please. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Please subscribe to our podcast and on YouTube. And uh, if you share a screenshot on social media, he's going to call you. Uh, or <laughs> no. text you or write back something. He's going to do something for you. And until next time, uh, be safe. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Jack. We'll see you next time. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs>